Hi, in this session 5.5, you will learn about societal impact assessments. You should do these assessments to ensure that adverse societal consequences of a solution are minimized and positive effects are maximized. Thereby, you indirectly improve the effectiveness of a solution and you build on societal resilience. The SEA method is a support tool for trial organizers throughout all steps of the TGM. This session is therefore aimed at trial organizers and solution providers. The core objectives are to understand the concept of societal impact and to be able to apply the methodology to on your own solutions and trial setup and therefore assess its societal impact. This training session is split into four sections. The first section will introduce the concept of societal impact assessment, or in short, SEA, and explain why it is a necessary component of the solution development process and is a crucial step for setting up a trial. Also, we will also shortly present research ethics and awareness about the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. This will be addressed in this e-lecture. The third and fourth section will provide practice in doing SEA and will be delivered through an in-person training session during the contact phase. The third section will explain the methodology of the Driver Plus SEA framework. The fourth section will put the SEA into practice, as learners and participants will apply the framework to case studies. We now start with what societal impact assessment entails. SEA is done during the solution selection step, as it will inform on the selection of the most appropriate solution. The approach and concepts of this method can be applied and considered at any step and any phase of the TGM. For instance, also when communicating your trial results to externals in the final documentation and dissemination step. The objective of SEA is to become aware of the societal impact a solution could have. Note that this impact can be positive, but could also have negative side effects. Similarly, your trial setup can also have unforeseen positive and negative effects. Hence, it is important to spend some time in assessing this in detail. This effort is important for all stakeholders of a trial, especially the core committee formed by the trial owner and the three coordinators. Also, information from the solution providers and participants could be necessary to conduct a SEER. We can note several definitions of societal impact, with variations from field to field. The International Principles for Social Impact Assessment defines as SEER the process of analyzing, monitoring, and managing the intended and unintended social consequences, both positive and negative, of planned interventions, such as policies, programs, plans and projects, and any social change processes invoked by those interventions. Social impact can be seen as how organizations, businesses, or individuals' actions affect the surrounding community. It can be the result of an activity, project, program, or policy and can be intentional or unintentional, as well as both positive or negative. It can be experienced by people directly associated with that organization or individual, or have a more far-reaching effect on people in different communities, states, or even countries. Two points to note on this definition. Research ethics. Societal impact does not mean research ethics in this context. Research ethics can have societal impacts. But for this session, we are distinguishing between the two. We are thinking more about long-term, conceptual and abstract issues relating to society, rather than the administrative issues that may affect society, e.g. GDPR or informed consent. Efficiency The purpose of doing a SEER is not to directly improve the efficiency of crisis management solutions. Rather, it is to increase the positive impact that CM solutions can have on societal values and principles and mitigate negative impacts. It is about understanding the risks and consequences of using a specific crisis management solution. As an example, doing a SEER on public announcements by governments regarding a potential terror threat to the population is not intended to improve the means of communication or help the message be disseminated more widely. 
but undertaking a SEER may flag the potential impact on the public trust in government if this type of communication doesn't provide accurate information and concrete advice. This could then indirectly improve the efficiency of the solution. As government warnings are shown to be trustworthy and reliable, citizens are more alert and conscious of a potential threat. Why is SEER crucial to consider? Societal impact is important because it looks at determinants, perceptions, attitudes and behaviours that are associated with the safety and well-being of a population. Evoking positive change in these determinants can be a step towards sustainability. As it becomes easier to address root causes and promote behaviour types that support sustainable change, research and investments can become more valuable and more effective. Crisis management solutions don't take place in a vacuum, so taking society into account is crucial to ensure acceptance of solutions by general public and practitioners. Taking society into account makes solutions themselves more resilient and future-proof as society and crisis management evolves. It can help develop more rounded and effective solutions by highlighting weaknesses and allowing for more informed decision-making when choosing a solution to implement. Crisis managers have a base level of accountability and responsibility for their actions and solutions, and undertaking SEER can strengthen accountability, as it gives greater proof for the validity of a certain solution. All of these factors contribute to the sustainability of CM solutions, as keeping broader societal context in mind improves the chances of offered solutions being adopted and can therefore make implementation more effective. To give a brief example of SEER in action, WhatsApp has been considered for use as a crisis communications tool in India. However, rumours that spread via WhatsApp caused the death of dozens of people in India, as a tragic consequence of the use of the group chat function. Therefore, its use as a crisis management communications tool through participation in large group chats should be considered. In 2017, the use of WhatsApp was very different, far more one-directional, broadcast messages relayed through large group chats, often in the form of videos that, for example, would call for charity for certain events or warn against local criminals. This latter practice has led to the spread of unverified and uncontextualized rumors, which caused the death of several people. One video that was shared shows a child being kidnapped in the street by two people on a motorbike. This was an advertisement being filmed in Karachi, Pakistan, for an awareness campaign but was shared indiscriminately across parts of India, leading to recriminations against people identified as being part of the kidnapping gang. How is SEER relevant to this case? The case clearly shows the need for reliable, responsible, informed crisis communication tools and unintended consequences of encouraging the use of social media as a tool for disseminating information, and possible consequences of involving citizens more actively in management of crises. Social media enables citizens to participate more actively in crisis management, providing, for example, situational analysis. Without standardized and transparent mechanisms to verify information, rumors that spread on social media can make crisis management more difficult. SEA is relevant to this case as without the recognition of the potential consequences and taking steps to mitigate the risks, a valuable tool can have negative consequences and reduce its effectiveness in future situations. Undertaking a SEER would allow practitioners to more thoroughly assess a tool for its likely impact. Now that you understand the concept of SEER and why they are important, we can demonstrate the process that you will learn in the next session and put it into practice, to give context for this session. The steps that are undertaken to perform a SEER are as follows. 1. Identify stakeholder groups, communities. The first step would be to identify the stakeholders and the community that could potentially be impacted by the implementation of the solution. This includes the groups affected by the crisis and the stakeholders involved in implementing the solution. 2. Collect background information. The second step is to collect reference information covering key social issues of the impacted communities. This is information such as community history, culture and key events that have shaped the development of the community. 3. Get an overview of legislation and policies. Provide an overview of relevant national or European legislation and policies that complement the mitigation measures that are directly related to the trial. These mitigation measures will come back in Step 5. In this context, they don't have to be specific. 
4. Identify and predict impacts. This is the main part of the SEER. In this step, using the information gathered in steps 1 to 3 and the description of the functions of each solution, the societal impacts of the solution will be considered. To structure this exercise, a list of criteria has been defined upon which the function should be assessed. These are grouped around different themes and will be explained in more detail in a moment. The criteria are not all relevant. The idea is to choose the ones that are the most relevant and to try to predict how the solution will impact that criteria and the significance, duration and extent of the impact. 5. Describe mitigating measures and follow up. Having identified which criteria may be affected, action can be taken in order to either mitigate effects or enhance them. Step 5 asks you to list some potential measures and actions, such as providing extra follow-ups for volunteers, establish rapport with local community leaders, engaging with the communities and sharing more information about the activity. A plan should then be made to describe how the mitigating measures will be followed up on. If we now use the five-step SEER process on the WhatsApp example case, we see that the stakeholders are the official and unofficial broadcasters and the audiences of these. When looking at the background, we see language skills, location, and the composition of the audience played a role. From a legal and policy perspective, WhatsApp's end-to-end -end encryption and private data ramifications are important to consider. From this case, you can see that fundamental human rights can be at stake when such communication systems are used. It can impact the legitimacy of official organizations and can increase secondary insecurities. To mitigate negative effects, the information source of a rumor or piece of information should be very clear. Also, these pieces of information should be well introduced. For instance, by communicating the kidnap video was made in the context of an awareness campaign in the Karachi region. Next to being aware about the social impact your trial design could have, it's also important to know about research ethics and the European General Data Protection Regulation. After all, your trial is a form of research and you will collect data during this event. Research ethics apply to all phases of the TGM. The main objective of research ethics is to prevent unethical setups, either consciously intended or, which is most often the case, unconscious and unforeseen. Next to this, you should simply adhere to the European laws regarding privacy and data protection. Taking some time to reflect on the ethical dimension of what you are doing is something that should be done by everyone involved in a trial. In your professional career, you most probably have already dealt with ethics before. We do not doubt you are working in the domain of crisis management to make the world a better place, either directly as a crisis management practitioner or as a solution provider or technician. And because you want to make the world a better place by improving crisis management processes, you want to do a trial. A trial is performed using a staged or simulated crisis or disaster. You simulate such an incident to assess new solutions, simply because it is unacceptable to do this assessment during a real crisis. After all, you do not yet know what effects these solutions will have. That's exactly why you want to do a trial. This in itself is already an ethical consideration. But research ethics is more than just avoiding to do harm during real crises. It is also about honesty, objectiveness and openness about how you did your research. There is a lot to find out on research ethics and its generic principles. Please do look around online. In the remainder of this session, we focus on some specific topics we came across during the organization of previous trials. Issues relating to research ethics are relevant across all the three performance measurement dimensions of a trial. If you are not familiar with these three dimensions, check session 2.1. Research ethics rules and norms are part of the TGM and have to be considered when setting up and conducting a trial. Mostly, they are dealing with the protection of data. Whenever human beings are involved in the activities of a trial, data protection rules and requirements have to be followed in order to protect their privacy and to regulate their participation. Hence, the ethical guidelines of the TGM focus on the rights of the data subjects that are potentially participating in the trial activities. These obligations are most notably defined in the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, of the EU. The GDPR is structured around a handful of privacy principles, which we explain in the next slide. 
Afterwards, we roughly present which requirements and recommendations of the GDPR apply to which phases of the TGM, and can therefore help ensuring the rights of data subjects during the trial. First, an overview of some of the key GDPR principles. Lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. To be lawful, one or several conditions must be fulfilled. These conditions are, for example, the data subject has given consent to the processing of his or her personal data for one or more specific purposes. The conditions for consent have been strengthened, and consent must be provided in an intelligible and easy accessible form using plain language. Collection, Processing and Purpose Limitations The GDPR states that personal data can only be obtained for specified, explicit and legitimate purposes. Further, data subjects should be able to consent only to certain parts of research projects to the extent allowed by the intended purpose. Accuracy. Data must be accurate and, where necessary, kept up to date. Data minimization and privacy by design. Data collected on a subject should be adequate, relevant and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purposes for which they are processed. Privacy by design calls for the inclusion of data protection from the onset of the designing of systems, rather than an addition. Storage limitations or integrity and confidentiality. Personal data should be kept in a form which permits identification of data subjects for no longer than necessary. Appropriate security of the personal data, including protection against unlawful processing or accidental loss, destruction or damage, has to be ensured. Further, every data subject has the right to be forgotten, which means that their data is deleted under specific conditions. If we take the principles of the GDPR and apply them to the distinct phases of the TGM, we can derive requirements and recommendations that act as guidelines. The following guidelines reflect some of the most anticipated issues and concepts for organizing a trial. These guidelines are only exemplary. You can find further, more detailed information in the TGM handbook. We start with some of the main requirements and recommendations from the GDPR that apply to the preparation phase. You need to ensure that data is collected for specified, explicit and legitimate purposes and not further processed in a manner that is incompatible with those purposes. Further, inform the data subject about the data controller's identity and contact information. What kind of data will be collected and processed? how the result of their contribution will be used, and make sure that the data actually collected matches this description. Give anyone potentially affected by it the possibility to refuse from being observed or recorded. Always inform all participants and potential bystanders thoroughly and well ahead of the conducted research. The data subject shall have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, which produces legal effects concerning him or her or similarly significantly affects him or her. Hence, you need the subject's consent if the automated processing is required. Moreover, avoid collecting unnecessary data. Ensure security of data. This also includes anonymity and encryption. Use technology for data recording only if necessary and provide justification. Now, the requirements and recommendations from the GDPR that apply to the execution phase. Many of the requirements already apply to the preparation phase. For example, be clear about the purpose, minimize data, secure data, get consent for automated processing, and use technology for data recording only if necessary. In case servers are hacked or if personal data is otherwise obtained by someone without permission to access it, breach notifications are now mandatory. Refrain from processing data that is not up to date. Keep in mind that every data subject has the right to be forgotten if the required conditions apply. Otherwise, you should be able to explain why the right cannot be fulfilled at the moment. Last but not least, we come to the requirements and recommendations from the GDPR that apply to the evaluation phase. Again, many of the already known guidelines apply to this phase. For example, to notify when servers are hacked, to ensure data security, keep data up to date and ensure the right to be forgotten. Further, do not reuse data without written agreement. An updated signed informed consent form should be obtained from the data subject when a controller intends to process data for a further purpose. If personal data is contained in the description of trial results stored in the POS, 
this should be justified. In addition to ensuring that personal data is collected for specified, explicit and legitimate purposes, make sure that the data is not further processed in a manner that is incompatible with those purposes. Let's recap SIA and research ethics in a nutshell. SIA is a process to do at least when selecting the solutions and which can be applicable in all steps of the TGM. Societal impact assessment is about gaining an understanding of and trying to anticipate for the potential consequences of deploying a solution. These consequences can either have positive or negative impacts. Undertaking a SIA will allow you to take steps to mitigate the negative impacts and enhance the positive impacts. You do a societal impact assessment by following the five-step process. During the contact phase of this training module, you can practice with this method by going through a couple of case studies. Research ethics have to be considered when setting up and conducting a trial. They are relevant across all three trial dimensions. Particular attention has to be paid to the protection of data of trial participants. Guidelines for the different phases of the TGM can be derived from the principles of the General Data Protection Regulation GDPR, of the EU. This is the end of session 5.5. Thank you for your attention.